Good morning. So please uh, find your seats for our first panel. Over the last couple days, we've covered some very serious issues, very complicated issues, issues facing the globe and our country. When you think about tackling those issues, they're challenging enough with a 100% united political ideology. When you throw in bipartisan politics and the challenges that emanate from that, this could be one of the bigger issues facing us as we try to take on those outrageous challenges ahead. Today our moderator, Josh Gersting from Politico, started his beat with Politico right as Obama was taking office, focused in on the commitments to get out of Guantanamo Bay, and reported on that effort and the challenges that subsumed. Reported on some of the issues the detainees were facing, and is also focused on the Information Freedom Act and is an expert in that area. Additionally, he's done some outstanding reporting on the leaked classified information and our handling of it. So I think he's uniquely positioned to understand the events we're facing. Now one of the challenges is preparing for this, five weeks ago, 10 weeks ago, you would have talked about a whole different set of issues. And then as of this morning, you might change them yet again. So this should be very interesting for us. The floor is yours, take care. Thanks, Mike. Um, you're quite right. The, you know, we've been talking and communicating about what we we're going to discuss on this panel for more than a couple months now, and the, the list seemed to rotate. Uh, I thought it was only weekly, but then uh, I don't know how many folks heard about the evacuation of our embassy in Libya uh, today. Uh, so really, it seems like on a daily basis, the list of crises that um, both the Obama administration and the Congress have to address seems to get longer and longer. Uh, so it's been a challenge to th think about what we're going to talk about, even within this field of how, how Congress and politics is responding to these national security uh, challenges. Um, I want to also, before we get started, thank uh, Clark for uh, organizing yet another very interesting uh, high-minded forum. We're now going to drag the discussion down into the gutter of politics uh, for a little while. <laughs> Uh, we'll try to keep it, um, keep it clean. Uh, and also Walter Isaacson for being behind the Aspen Institute uh, more generally. Um, the chairman, when I was speaking to him last night, suggested uh, maybe I'd tell a quick story about my, how my interest in uh, this issue of terrorism uh, began. It involves at least one or two other people in this room. Uh, I was working at CNN straight out of college in the early 1990s, around the time of the first World Trade Center bombing. and. Um, I think a lot of people sort of shrugged off that event as just sort of a weird, uh, a weird anomaly. Um, the people that carried it out didn't seem uh, terribly sophisticated. You may remember they were stupid enough to take their rental van back to the uh, rental shop right after the bombing to try to get their refund or something like that. So, balance the budget. Yeah. so it seemed a little bit like a Keystone Cop situation, but there were a few people saying, you know, this is more serious than that, and we should look into it in more detail. It links back to Afghanistan. It has to do with the war in the 80s, and it could be a long-term threat to our country. <clears throat> we ended up doing a whole documentary at CNN at that time on that question. Um, Peter Bergen, who many of you know, uh, who's been here at this conference, uh, was one of the producers that I worked with um, on that documentary, and eventually, over a period of years, led to the interview with this obscure figure in uh, Afghanistan called Osama bin Laden. Um, so that's sort of the, my personal history at the beginning of this issue. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our two panelists. I assume almost everybody in the room knows uh, who these folks are. We have uh, Congressman Mike McCall of Texas, who is the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee um, since last year. Um, I'll see if I get these, uh, uh, these numbers right. So you're in your fifth term, uh, if that's correct, in his district. Uh, runs from a chunk of Austin all the way across to most of the area west, uh, west of Houston. Um, his connection to terrorism dates back at least to the 1990s when uh, he was a counterterrorism prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Was that in San Antonio or where, where, what city was in that? In Austin. In Austin. Yeah. Um, as a federal <coughs> prosecutor in the 90s and then worked for uh, the Texas uh, Attorney General thereafter, Clark uh, Irvin told me that they both worked together for John, John Cornyn when he was the Attorney General um, of Texas uh, earlier, earlier on. Um, 
Jane Harmon uh, needs no introduction to probably those who are here in attendance at this um, event, but if people aren't familiar, uh, she spent nine terms in Congress uh, from California, serving on the Armed Services Committee, Intelligence Committee. Um, she didn't spend nine terms, she was elected to nine terms, if I'm right, and spent a little more than eight terms before joining the Wilson Center. Is that? Left in the, the middle of my ninth term. That left in, left in her ninth term to go to the Wilson Center uh, and become the head of that great group in Washington, which really cultivates, I think, a lot of the thought leaders on national security issues. Uh, and she was also on to this threat of terrorism very early, as many of you have heard from her about uh, the work she did on the, um, I think it was called the National Commission on Terrorism. Uh, back, the report came out back in 2000, <coughs> warning about the likelihood that the country would uh, face uh, some kind of very serious terrorist attack in the near future, which turned out to be prescient. I think Maurice Sonnenberg, who's, who's here, or is at least at this event, right if not there. in the room, there he is, Vice was Chair. also, was also on that um, commission. And I think for the purpose of this panel also, it's worth noting that Jane has been a voice both while in Congress and outside Congress for um, bipartisanship and uh, what we use, sometimes call comity, uh, and not comedy, comity. And, uh, and sanity uh, in Congress. So um, I'm very pleased to have them uh, both here this morning to talk about how Congress and the political world is responding to these national security challenges. I thought what we might do is talk about a few of the specific crises and problems that we're facing at the moment um, and then move to a broader discussion about um, how well positioned we are to tackle these issues as a government and how, how Congress is dealing with them. Um, Chairman McCall, I thought I'd start with you. Um, given that you're from Texas, um, you don't have a border district, but you're fairly close to the border. Yeah. Um, I thought we should talk a little <laughs> bit about the situation there with the, the child uh, migrants, the surge. Uh, I think you ha held a field hearing uh, to talk about that. What do you know? What have you seen of that situation? And there's been a lot of intense negotiation in Congress in the last week uh, about, I think uh, President Obama requested $3.7 billion to address that problem. Where do you see that going? Where does that stand? Is there any chance that the Republican House will uh, go along with the president's request? Right. Well, I mean, first, it, it's a human tragedy, what's happening down there, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, <clears throat> I went down there, as you mentioned, chaired a field hearing, went to the intake center, and, and, and what you see, you have to really be prepared uh, f to look at little kids. And I saw little girls, um, you know, mothers with their babies, um, and then we saw 17-year-old uh, males, children, uh, that didn't look so cute uh, to me, that we wondered what will they do in the United States if, if they get in. I think we have to deal with this in a very humane, compassionate way. Um, but the problem won't stop until we send a message of deterrence. The, um, you know, I was on the speaker's working group. We made recommendations two days ago to our conference on how to handle the situation. Uh, but without deterrence, they're gonna to continue to come. They have taken some of the executive actions and the traffickers have exploited those to uh, the families in Central America uh, that if you come to the United States, you can stay. You get a free pass, a permiso. And they charge about anywhere between five to $10,000 per child. Uh, they exploit them. They give the girls who are 12 to 13 year old, years old contraceptives, uh, the coyotes do, on their way up their treacherous route, perilous route through Mexico because most of them are raped uh, along the way. The three little girls I talked to, the raft flipped over, they almost drowned, uh, they're abused. Um, so we have to stop this. The host countries don't, they want their children back. Every government we talk to, so we, we want our children back. And so we believe that the best way to humanely deal with this is to obviously appropriate dollars to take care of these children while they're in the United States, but to send a message that, we're, that we are going to swiftly uh, remove them back to their country of origin. That will stop the flow from coming in. There are tens of thousands on their way up right now as I speak. My concern is that in August with the heat, as Jane knows, uh, you're gonna have some of these kids dying. Um, and I said to our conference, to members of my party that didn't want to do anything, that that's not an option. We have to do something. We have a crisis. We need leadership, and we need to act. So I think you're going to see dollars appropriated for um, 
a swift removal process for detention facilities, for judges, maybe video conference or special masters to deal with the situation. Um, and you're also going to see some border security related provisions, some of which comes out of the bill I passed out in my committee. Um, probably you'll see the National Guard being deployed down there on a temporary basis um, and other border security assets that we want to put down there. I think key to this, though, too, from a security standpoint, is the border between Guatemala and Mexico. It's not nearly as wide as the southwest border that we have. We already have Southcom deployed. Now, Mexico won't receive our military uh, for historical and cultural reasons. Maurice, you know that very well. But Guatemala has accepted us there to act in a security role to help secure that, that piece of the border so they can't even make it out of Central America. But I think once the children start going back and the families realize that they paid five to 10000 for nothing, then I think you'll see the numbers going down. And we won't have to build these big warehouses for kids, detention facilities. It's a very hard subject because it sounds harsh, but there's no other way to deal with it. And it's going to impact every district throughout the nation. And what do you think will happen in terms of one of the key issues here is this law that was put into effect in 2008 that basically, if I understand it correctly, says that Me Mexican and Canadian children that come into the U.S. unaccompanied can be sort of immediately returned. Um, children from other countries that show up in the U.S. actually end up going into sort of either foster care or being put in uh, with members of their family uh, and end up staying for quite a while. Some of the rumors or the, the while the coyotes may be telling false stories, mm -hmm. some of the stories are true, right? I mean, it, it is the case that many children end up under the current system getting to stay. So is that going to be changed by this legislation? And the other thing I wanted to ask is you're talking about children possibly dying in August, <clears throat> which is a few days from now. Can Congress move quickly enough before it leaves for its August recess yeah. to fix this problem? Because uh, Secretary Johnson said that he thinks very soon they're going to run out of money. Yeah, to do I, it. I mean, our goal, I think they're reprogramming some monies to get through the end of the year. But we believe we have to appropriate monies for ICE and DHS. Um, <clears throat> we want to get this done before the August recess. Now, none of us want to go home for August and be portrayed as being on vacation while this crisis is going on, particularly uh, in my home state. Now, you talk about this law. A well-intentioned law, it passed uh, by voice vote. None, nobody was there when it passed. Senator Feinstein put in this provision, well-intentioned, but the unintended consequence is the, is the crisis you're seeing today. And, and what it basically says is that if you're from a non-contiguous uh, country, uh, you're treated differently. So Mexico and Canada, there's a pretty swift removal process in place already within 72 hours. If you're from Central America or other than Mexico, 72 hours, and Jay Johnson talked to me about this law. He actually privately supports changing this law. He sees it as the problem. Um, I think he, the problem has gotten political because the president doesn't want to be the one to change the law. He'd rather see us do it in the Congress. So the long and short of it is under the current law, they have to hand the child over to HHS custody within 72 hours. Um, and then reunite with family in the United States and then given a notice to appear at a deportation hearing that will be probably five years down the road. So we think that law has to be changed to send a message of deterrence that you will be swiftly and humanely uh, removed and, and sent back home. Jane, do you well, want to talk about that? Too? Yeah, a couple of comments. First of all, Mike and I served together in Congress uh, for many years on the Homeland Security Committee. and. There was a time, I'm sure many of you cannot remember it, when the Democrats had the majority from 2006 to 2010, and I chaired the Intelligence and Terrorism Subcommittee of the Homeland Committee, and Mike was the ranking member, and we have gotten along famously. So bipartisanship does live. Uh, at least there are many friendships and many very collaborative relationships. On this law, it's, I, I would just add a few things. First of all, it did pass by voice vote. I was still in Congress then. And the point of it is to uh, deal with human trafficking. That's what the law was about. No one expected that it would be expanded to be the kind of pull factor for all these thousands of kids from Central America. Um, at the time, also, 
uh, Congress was trying to pass comprehensive immigration reform, which is still the right answer. If we had comprehensive immigration reform, something proposed by President Bush uh, and, and uh, uh, supported vigorously by Michael Chertoff, who's in the audience here, I think he is. Michael, are you here? Stepped out. Stepped out. Well, anyway, a shout out to Michael. Uh, and supported by many there of us. There, there he is, is. Right there. comprehensive <laughs> immigration reform. Uh, if we could pass yeah. that, uh, if we could pass that, that is a much more humane way to deal with these uh, kids because after all, uh, many of them will be sent back and I agree that they should be sent back. Uh, but, but those that disappear, and many of them do, over 50% are disappearing. They reunite with their families here and they don't show up for their hearings and we can't find them. Uh, those kids go into the e illegal diaspora here and they can be abused again. So it's not exactly a win if anyone thought it was for those kids. Finally, yesterday, uh, President Obama and Jay Johnson met with the presidents of El Salvador, uh, Honduras, and Guatemala uh, in uh, Washington. And the message there was they have to do more to stop this flow, but we can also help them. And there is some conversation, I don't know whether it will amount to anything about specifically in Honduras, which has the highest murder rate in the world, uh, the U.S. Uh, intervening in Honduras to find some kids who should qualify for asylum, find them there, and then safely transport them to the U.S., uh, avoiding all this coyote um, horror scene through Mexico. If I could, if we met with the, the speaker and I met with the presence as well uh, yesterday, and um, yeah, it was a very good meeting. We talked about, number one, the, the border of Guatemala and Mexico, putting Southcom down there. But we also talked to them about uh, what infrastructure do you have to receive these children. There are a lot of NGOs down there, Catholic Charities, there's infrastructure that we think we could provide funding to help uh, with uh, bringing the kids uh, back into their uh, countries. And, uh, you know, they, they made a very strong case for uh, work visas. Uh, if you would give us work visas, people could come up to work and see their family in the United States, but they would come back home. So you're not talking about the refugee issue now. You're talking about work permits. Yeah. Is that, uh, I suppose that ties into the issue of comprehensive <clears throat> immigration reform. The Republicans favored step-by-step -step or multi-bill approach, yeah. which the White House didn't think was a great idea, but said they would go along with and that it didn't happen. Is that something, you, you're not going to have work permits in this legislation no, to, the, that would no. be passed in the, the next week The 2008 law has, doesn't have to do with work permits. Right. It has to do with uh, human trafficking. And the asylum that's granted under that law is granted for, for, for kids and others who qualify right. under, under the terms. So I think it's very narrowly ta tailored, targeted towards change the 2008 law, appropriate dollars to keep DHS and ICE running, the judges and, and border security. You know, I remember General Kelly, the uh, general commander of Southcom, and he said, you know, if all these 60,000 kids can walk right in, let me tell you about these other threats that I see in, in, in South America. And he, see, he sees it very differently, and he's very concerned about our lack of, of border security. And that's something I've been talking about for quite some time. And I think I've seen in some of the accounts that not everybody that's showing up with these coyotes is from those three countries. There have been people from China. There have been people from other parts of the world that have showed up. And uh, it's not common, but it's certainly <coughs> an, a vulnerability that um, everybody can see. One final thing I want to ask you on that topic. Uh, the problem here has not always actually been in the House. Sometimes you can get some bipartisan agreement within the House. The problem has been getting the House and the Senate to see these things the same way. Do, you, do both of you or either of you think that that can also be addressed in, the, in, a, in a week's time, that uh, those disagreements could also be bridged? Well, I mean, it, it's a crisis. And, and like, to the, my members who said do nothing, uh, how, how can you possibly do it? Well, the president's not going to act and the president won't. But that, uh, using that theory, we wouldn't, we wouldn't pass any legislation. Right. Well, and, and so we need to do this, and I think Harry Reid I know the President, Jay Johnson, understand the, the ramifications of this. Reed has been using that 2008 law as sort of a, you know, I'm not going to negotiate on that. And I, I hope that he reconsiders that because that is a non-negotiable item coming out of the House. Well, a lot of the things that should be done to expedite removal can be done uh, without changing the law. Right. I, I'm not saying the law shouldn't be changed, but they can be done without changing the law. Yeah. Uh, what's sad about this is, as you said, uh, Congress is rushing to, to get to the August recess. It's an election year. 
Uh, neither side wants to be blamed for doing nothing, and I'm excluding Mike from this comment, but the paradigm in Congress now, and both sides do it, is to blame the other side for not solving the problem. Because if you can blame the other side, then you can put on a negative ad in your campaign and people respond, uh, sadly, voters respond to negative ads, and that gets you, keeps you elected or uh, hurts your opponent if your opponent is the incumbent. And it's a, it's a tragedy. There are good people in both parties in Congress who want to get something done, but the business model's broken. You know, if I can add on that, <clears throat> I mean, there are some argue, let's let the president own this mess. Or, you know, on the other hand, how, let House Republicans own, let them be the, the source of the problem. I'm not interested in that, in that game. I, I, I'm interested in solutions Can and, we and applaud Mike for that comment, for that, please? You know? <laughs> And that's what I told my conference. I said, we need to get something done and be the party of solutions and not saying no. Here, so here. thank you, Jane, for that. Let's turn for a minute to some of the more uh, typical topics of discussion for this conference on the, the front of uh, terrorism. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, developments, as I've said, just in the <coughs> last couple months, uh, in particular, people very concerned about the situation in Syria and Iraq, about this ISIS, ISIL, uh, group that has emerged. Um, starting with you, Chairman, I'm wondering if you could tell us how concerned you are about that and how does this fit in as the Homeland Security Chairman, you oversee uh, DHS. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, how that works. But um, in terms of the threat picture, what are the threats you're most concerned about? How does that new phenomenon in Syria and Iraq fit into that? And What's going on? We're hearing about new changes to our um, airline security just in the last few weeks uh, because of possibly concerns about foreign fighters from Syria coming back yeah, to the U.S. It, it's the biggest threat to the homeland, and I know Secretary Johnson agrees with that. And the reason, we've seen this brewing for the last two years. Uh, as Jay and I would get these intelligence threat briefings that I get, and with each one, this ISIS thing seemed to be intensifying. Um, it initially began as a you know anti-Assad movement. Now it's turned into an offshoot that's so strange. You have al-Nusra and you have ISIS, and they're in competition. It's ISIS is so extreme that Zawahiri has denounced them as being their tactics are too extreme. Now imagine that core Al Qaeda saying that you're too extreme in your tactics, but that's what we're talking about, and it's the biggest safe haven in the world now, and because of that. It's the biggest terrorist training ground. It's a lot easier to get to than the Fatah in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we're seeing foreign fires pouring in every day from the United States, from Europe, from Australia, many of them with clean documents, legal travel documents, some of whom can blend in. We have Norwegians and French. Uh, there's a, there's a, a warning in, in Norwegian, uh, Norwegian today uh, about a, a, a Syrian foreign fighter. This is going to be the threat we're going to be dealing with for the next decade. Um, as they build their safe haven, their caliphate, if we can't take them out there, and they continue to fester, um, and in addition to that threat is the connection between AQAP in Yemen and al-Nusra. Now, what's that connection? AQP, they're the premier bomb makers. Al-Siri, the premier bomb maker for al-Qaeda. And so this connection between them and al-Nusra in Syria, where you have this this combination of technology and manpower coming together. To me, that, that was why the warning was issued. I don't know if John Pistol's here, but he did the right thing uh, in guarding our, our airports overseas uh, because this is a real threat. There are attempts to build non-metallic IEDs like the underwear bomber to get through our de detection systems. Um, they still are very intent on in blowing up airplanes. You said if we, I'll turn to Jane one second, but you said if we can't take them out or something like that. Well, how look, do we, how, when we're talking about ISIS now, how do we take them? You're about, talking about another drone campaign. I mean, even President Obama has said that in Iraq, he's concerned that the military there is so dysfunctional and so divided and, uh, and non-responsive that they may not be a viable partner for us to try to go after well, this think, group. I mean, so drones are effective, but they, have, they can't kill an ideology, number one. But let me say this. They can be effective. I think in this instance, how did we get here? We didn't have a status of forces agreement in Iraq. Uh, Maliki completely blew it with the Sunni tribal leaders over the last five years. 
So that entire country has imploded. So all the investment of blood and treasure we put into Iraq is now imploding, and it's becoming this big safe haven for this caliphate uh, for ISIS. I've, I've argued when I talked to Petraeus and I talked to uh, Ryan Crocker, uh, General Austin, what do you think we should be doing? We, they think we could do limited airstrikes against ISIS without collateral damage to the Sunnis, but have this political diplomatic reunification between Sunni and Shia, which is fundamentally important first and foremost. But the, taking out the threat over there not only stabilizes, but it also takes out a threat to the homeland, in my view. Now, Jay may disagree with me on I, that, that I, particular one. It's way. not enough. Yeah. Uh, you can't play whack-a-mole and get out of this problem. And everyone who's looked at it says that. Petraeus certainly says it. Uh, even Don Rumsfeld said it in one of his snowflakes. He said, are we killing or capturing enough of them to prevent those who come behind? And the answer is no. Uh, I'm not against the judicious and focused use of drones, but there's a huge backlash to that. Yeah. What I'm for is a narrative that'll win the argument. If we don't persuade some kid trying to decide whether or not to strap on a suicide vest in the boonies of, of uh, Yemen or, or uh, Iraq uh, not to do it, uh, he's going to do it. And there are more of him than there are of leaders. So where's a narrative that will persuade these folks? The perception of U.S foreign policy, I'm not saying it is U.S. foreign policy, but the perception of our policy in much of the Middle East is don't do stupid stuff plus use drones. And I don't think that's winning any heart or mind or any mind or heart. I mean, some people think you have to win the minds first. Uh, the perception has to be that we stand for things uh, and not only stand for them, uh, live those values that are things that they want. And uh, we're just not making the sale right now for lots of reasons, including, my view, Mike might disagree with this, our failure to close uh, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, uh, we've done some things right. We picked up a, a real bad guy in Libya recently, and he's going to stand trial in the United States. Our laws can work. People can, can uh, be convicted of crimes uh, by our federal system and serve life sentences or even face the death penalty. Uh, and not endanger the rest of America. That shows that we abide by the rule of law. At any rate, I don't want to go on about this, but our narrative needs a lot of work. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in all the partisan sniping that goes on, not between us, uh, that gets lost. But isn't, isn't yeah. one of the problems, Jane, that the uh, kinetic actions, and that's an incredibly sterile term, we're talking about bombing uh, primarily. We're talking about killing people. Bombing and killing people. Uh, that undermines the narrative. You can't, and even well, Rumsfeld was, was acknowledging that you can't really go hard on one track and pretend you, like the other track But you have to do both. I mean, they're unreconcilable people. And uh, is anyone here sad that we took out Osama bin Laden? Raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> I, we had to do that. That was the right thing to do. And we have decapitated core Al-Qaeda. That's true. But the, the structure of of Al Qaeda Plus has morphed into more of a loose horizontal affiliation. And Mike is exactly right that these groups will uh, form alliances with the, this Al Asiri, the bomb maker, the guy who is the, you know, there's a guy, I'm sorry, I wouldn't cry if we took him out, in, uh, in Yemen. And he's the one who did the underwear bomb, the, the uh, uh, cartridge bomb, and is in the, the most advanced bomb maker, surely anywhere. Uh, who's trying to figure out how to evade all forms of detection that we have, uh, even those that John Pistol can't think of yet. And John Pistol, where's John Pistol? Is he here? He is, he's back. <clears throat> so awesome. I mean, thank you, John, for everything you do. Yep. But, but Jane, aren't those relatively easy cases compared to the question of are we going to mount some kind of broad military effort against ISIS, which now well, controls this whole swath I, of I, uh, I don't think a U.S.-led effort against ISIS makes any sense. I think what that would do, what, much as I'd like them to go away, uh, but I think what that would do would, would be unite everybody else against us. And I don't think at the moment we're the enemy. I think a, a smarter thing to do, and I'm certainly for ISIS being taken out, is to uh, help embolden the Sunnis who think ISIS has gone too far. I, my view, ISIS has overplayed this just as the precursor organization, uh, which was uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, overplayed it. Uh, there was a guy named Zarqawi whom we were able to kill during the war, uh, but he led the precursor organization. And his tactics led to the so-called Sunni awakening, which was a part, in addition to the US surge, yep. that won the effort, at least back in the day. 
Now, sadly, it's all gone backwards. But I think there's an argument that ISIS has, has overplayed it, as, as ghoulish as they are, and that yeah. if we were adroit, given all the enemies of ISIS, we could get a pushback locally that would be more effective than anything we could yeah, do. Yeah, I think a renewed, a renewed awakening uh, would be the way to go. It's very difficult because Maliki has given the Sunni tribal leaders no choice. So now they're siding with ISIS because they can't stand Maliki. Not that they particularly like them. <laughs> They don't like their tactics. And I think long term, they won't embrace them. But in the short term, it, it's a vehicle to get Maliki out of power. And I think that's precisely what's happening. And I agree with Jane did a good op-ed in the Washington Post on this issue. Drone star strikes are an effective tool, but they are not going to kill this ideology. This is a long-term struggle. It won't end in my lifetime. I hope it ends in my kids' uh, children, children's lifetime. And I think what's necessary is the moderate Muslim we really don't talk about enough as being an effective weapon against this ideology. And we're not tapping into that enough. And I think that should be a long-term strategy. Just so we can cover a few topics, let me try to make a, a sharp turn here and talk a little bit, because I know just in the next week, you expect to be working on this issue of cyber security. Um, you have some legislation. Uh, if I read correctly, it's supported by the financial services industry, the utility industry, and the ACLU, which seems almost impossible for me to understand <laughs> um, or even comprehend. See, Jay would be proud of that one. Um, I am proud of that. I never could get there. Tell us, for you. Tell us, <laughs> I'm not sure how we did that. <laughs> tell us how you manage that, and um, what do you think will happen with it? And also, if people don't know, there's also some legislation in the Senate uh, that moved out of the Intelligence Committee a few weeks ago uh, that's also in the area of cybersecurity. Um, We've seen the Congress really struggle for how many years now? Almost yep. 10 years, I think, trying to um, come up with some legislation to address cybersecurity and not really. Well, we were getting close, and then some, a guy named Snowden kind of came right. into the picture. He's still and, in and, the picture. And, and he still is. He's a, he's a traitor, and he's caused a lot of damage to the United States. Um, that derailed the whole cyber track, if you will. I, two months ago, I, I would tell you you're crazy we we're going to get cybersecurity legislation passed. The good news is we have a bill that's going to be on the floor next week. Um, you have CISPA, which deals with the NSA. My piece deals with, with DHS and, and the NKIC there, which is their cyber command. Why did the ACLU like this one and embrace it? It, was, it wasn't easy, Jane, but we got there. They want, they want a civilian interface to the private sector good. to share information with the critical infrastructures, particularly in light of post-Snowden. Um, By what you're saying the is they don't, they don't want the NSA in charge of this project. They don't so. want the NSA right. and the military right. involved in domestic critical infrastructure protection. That's really the role of DHS. And they're, while they're not, you know, let's face it, NSA, their expertise surpasses everybody. But DHS's capabilities are, are getting better, and they are the civilian interface to the private sector. And I think that's why it's been embraced. So my bill essentially codifies uh, what they're doing. Uh, over there, and I think you're going to see these bills coming out of the House and Senate that get married together, and hopefully CIS will, will be a part of it as well. Let, um, let me just add a couple of things to that. Cybersecurity is, uh, I, well, sh sure, counterterrorism is out there as a huge threat to us, but cybersecurity is a just as big a threat, and without legislation, industry cannot cooperate in the way it needs to. Uh, without uh, issues of legal liability. And it's absolutely critical, I'm looking at my friends from Target, for industry to cooperate with the federal government on this. 85% of our uh, infrastructure, I internet infrastructure, is in private hands. And a lot of what could happen, all the bad things that could happen to us, could happen through access to the private sector. So, you know, Congress doesn't always have to do everything, but it has to do this. And it's been stalled for years. Uh, comment on Snowden. I'm not a fan of his either, but he hasn't been convicted yet. So I am not labeling him. Lawyer and me is not labeling him as anything Let's except so. a bad guy. <laughs> well, let me ask you one, both of you, one Snowden question based on some of the panels that came before here. I think there's been this uh, view that was articulated that Snowden released this information. His release of the information caused this damage. Um, there's an alternative viewpoint, which is that some of the underlying programs are responsible for some of this damage. If I see a fire and I call it into the fire department, no one says, uh, you know, you're responsible for the fire unless they can show that I actually started it. So, um, and it seems to me there's some tacit acknowledgement of that 
by many in Congress and by the president, because well, he said, let's change the program. If it was perfect before, why tinker with it? Well, I was there, so I, I uh, and a lot of you were there. The, many of the founding fathers and mothers of our post-9-11 response are in this audience, and one of the wonderful things about it back in the day was, and it still is, uh, this crowd puts America first, doesn't put political party first, and that is something we need to celebrate, because as I've often said, the terrorists aren't gonna check our party registration before they blow us up. Uh, but at any rate, what we missed back in the day, I think, what we should have done is had a public debate about the strategies uh, that we needed to keep us safe. I think if we had had a public debate about the telephone metadata program, there would have been much more public support then than there is now, and people would have understood it. Uh, sadly, we didn't have that debate. A lot of the early versions of these programs were done uh, outside of Congress. They were done basically through the executive authority, the commander in chief authority of the president. And I- President I, Bush. I, president about. Bush. And I, I'm not piling on him because, again, we were all worried about being attacked again. I wish this had been done differently. I was then the ranking Democrat on the uh, House Intelligence Committee. I was in these so-called Gang of Eight briefings, uh, but the briefing basically said, uh, this is what we're doing, it fully complies with law. And I assumed that that meant it was, they were following the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is the law, and I had no way to check that because of the level of secrecy. And then I learned we weren't doing that, and then Congress came together in 2008 to amend FISA to fully cover these programs, which sunset, that means they have to be renewed every three years. So it, isn't, it wasn't as robust a public debate as we should have had, I'm glad we're having it now, uh, and I don't mind the fact, in fact, I support some of the changes to make these laws more transparent. But it is not fair to say that uh, either Congress slept through this or that the American public had no chance to know about this. And I'll ask the Congressman the same question, but w Jane, when did you um, know about, for example, the most widely publicized program, the 215 program? Um, did you're you learn me? about it in real time when it was I, the law was being I, reauthorized? I knew did there you was, understand it? Feel you understood? No, it? no. I, I didn't. I learned about it uh, beginning when I was uh, the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. I did not understand that it was designed outside of FISA. I learned that that was the case when the program leaked and uh, President Bush uh, declassified it in a Saturday morning address around Christmas time, and I then could call. Uh, a former general counsel of the CIA and asked him to walk me through the legal underpinnings of the program. And he basically said, hey, dummy, there's no possible way this could be complying with FISA, which led me uh, to uh, that, that day uh, say that that was wrong and we needed to have it uh, come fully within but the But you law. understood once Congress reauthorized it that this type of bulk collection was I taking did. place. I so. did understand, and let's understand, I mean, I think this audience is pretty sophisticated. This bulk collection is of, uh, and I understand because it shows duration of calls that you can find, find out about people, but this is a haystack. There's no access to the haystack unless you go through strict legal authorities. And the FISA court, which is a court of federal judges, rotating federal judges, approves what, what is going to happen. I'm not against uh, limiting the program further, moving the metadata out of government hands. Um, but I do believe that the program has worked in a number of instances, and I do think we need a system where we can track in advance who bad guys are talking to or emailing with. Otherwise, we're not going to prevent them from acting. Chairman, did you understand before the Snowden leaks the volume of data that the NSA was collecting no. domestically? No, I mean, you know, the way the House intelligence, it's very compartmentalized uh, within the Congress. So. I worked on FISA applications with the FBI when I was a federal prosecutor. Back then, we would go through the private phone carriers to get that information. Didn't really conceive at that point in time that all this data would be in bulk collection warehoused under the NSA. And I think from the American people's standpoint, I think that's what spooked them. Mm -hmm. Was not so much that, okay, the government's getting information about foreign terrorists, and there is a FISA court that deals with this, but rather, the government has everybody's telephone records. And I, I think that was where, as Jane talks about, because there wasn't any public debate, it's so closely held. The oversight, you know, it's one area that GAO cannot go into. You can't task government accountability off say, we look at this metadata program, tell me what the, if it's the value to it and what's happening and what's the cost-benefit ratio. 
you can't do that. And so we did reform FISA to really almost go back to how we used to do this process, and that is going through the private uh, phone carriers. And I think, you know, look, is it more efficient and effective to have it, you know, under the NSA? Of course. And from a national security standpoint, it makes me feel safer. But on the other hand, you have to deal with the, the, the American people and their perception of we don't want the government to warehouse everybody's phone records. Uh, you know, you know, yeah. and, and you think that will so be. So I think we struck the right balance um, at the end of the day. Because um, in the May, the House passed this USA yeah. Freedom Act, at yeah. least a version but of it. It's not yeah. over yet. The Senate has uh, proposed, Pat Leahy has proposed yeah. some additional reforms uh, through the Senate Judiciary Committee. And those reforms, which I think are okay, uh, yeah. I've now gotten the civil liberties community to climb on. But the bottom line is that the metadata will no longer be stored by the government. It will be stored by the phone companies for a period of time, not, not an arbitrary one, the, the period that they store data. And there will be much more transparency, which I am for. And uh, these FISA court decisions, which have not been rubber stamp decisions, uh, will be, depending on the circumstance, and sometimes redacted, that means some names taken out, uh, released to the public so that there will be a, a much more, a much higher comfort level with these programs. But we have to find out uh, what these foreign terrorists are, are trying to do. I mean, this is as, as uh, probably a more dangerous time, since the threat is more diverse, than, than what we faced on 9-11. And we can't, I, I think, tie our hands behind our backs. Well, that's a 9-11 commission report. I, I appeared with them. They talk about complacency. And, and also, this. No, I fear the terrorists more than my own government. And unfortunately, that whole Snowden thing had people fearing their own government more than the terrorists. I think the threat is, as Jane pointed out, far greater from the terrorists. Al Qaeda owns more territory now than they ever have. They have 16, they're in 16 different countries. They have more money, more capability than they ever have. And as that threat grows overseas, so too does that threat to the homeland. And that's my biggest concern as the chairman of Homeland Security. And I do want to talk. To, we mentioned uh, to the CNN reporter and John Pistol, TSA, you know, the, all the American people see of TSA is the screeners at the airports, and they hate that. What they don't know is that TSA overseas is stopping these foreign terrorists from getting into the United States. And that's the, the better face, if you will, I think, of what TSA does. But it's, it's not well known. And they do a great job at keeping them out. You mentioned, uh, Chairman, the 9-11 uh, commission report, the re-report that came out, and you guys had a hearing on it last week. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their recommendations is, and was discussed at some panels here before, uh, to address the oversight of DHS, uh, the various tallies of 92 committees and subcommittees, if you include some of the task forces and panels, maybe more than 100 that have some oversight authority over DHS. Um, having been at a few of these conferences, I can tell you this subject has come up every single year. Um, could either of you talk to us about is there a practical way to reform it? I think most people would concede the problem, but the problem hasn't been fixed. It was clearly part of the compromise that led to the, um, the legislation that created DHS in the first place was to not fix this part of the problem right now. Um, now we have to live with that consequence. Is there a way, a practical way, to address this problem? It's the only recommendation of the 9-11 Commission that was not fulfilled. We, the, we talk about the executive branch being siloed and dysfunctional, but the Congress is siloed on this issue. This was a, a compromise hybrid, and so now the secretary, and now Turtov's here, reporting to almost 100 committees and subcommittees. Yeah. Do you know how dangerous that is? It takes the secretary away from his main job and purpose, and that is to protect the American people. And the 9-11 Commission came out with some very strong statements not only at our press conference, but at the hearing about how Congress will be to blame for the next terrorist attack. I'm, I'm taking all these clippings, believe me, and presenting the, them to my leadership to say, look, this is not, this shouldn't be all about jurisdiction. We need to fix this because it's a threat to the American people. And, what is your and, and I also plan to, for the first time, believe this, no, I'm doing authorization bills uh, individually. But next Congress, I, I'm going to push the first authorization bill for the Department of Homeland Security ever. Good. What does that mean? Yeah. Tell people what that means. This, in a well, this sense. department, unlike any other department in the federal government, has never has never been authorized 
by the United States Congress. How crazy. I mean, how crazy is that? And how damaging is well, that? An, an authorization bill is a comprehensive budget for an agency. And a Homeland has been a work in progress. It was designed as a, a collection of 22 agencies and departments. And integrating that is, has been hard. Um, but there has been enormous progress. This ad was in, uh, I think, the New York Times and a lot of other places by several groups uh, talking about the dysfunctional organization of Congress. Uh, they're absolutely right, but I'm uh, pretty pessimistic on whether Congress can do something about it. The reason for that is uh, that the leadership in Congress in both sides uh, is elected by votes of their caucuses. And their caucuses work, work their way up over years to get senior positions in Congress. There's been a lot of turnover in Congress. In fact, in the three years since I've been gone, um, I don't know what percentage is new. But nonetheless, people fight for every, it's like, well, I won't go there. They fight for every inch of, of territory and power. So the, the chairs of the other committees don't want to give up power to enable the Homeland Committee to have the jurisdiction it needs to oversee the 22 departments and agencies. And the leadership has a disincentive to make them do that, because then they'll be mad at the leadership and yep. may not vote to reelect the leadership. And uh, President <coughs> Obama said that this would be a priority, making, uh, you know, improving relations with Congress, but seems to have dropped that quite a while ago. So that the question to me is, uh, will the next president, whoever she may be, uh, push harder? <laughs> And, and Congressman, do you, what did the leadership say to you when you did? Well, is there they, interest they, they or fully, concern about this? They fully no? recognize the problem. Okay. I mean, John Boehner understands this. Uh, and I think Jane has correctly identified the problem. Jurisdiction's the holy grail, and no chairman wants to give it up. So really only leadership and the speaker primarily has the power to go to them to say, you got to change this. I think the best opportunity to have done this was eight years ago. And from what I understand in the rules package on, in your conference when you had the majority, it got shot down and right. they tried to do it. I will attempt right. to present it before my conference, um, but I, I think it's going to be a very uh, a difficult uh, uphill battle. But you know what Jamie Gorelick said when she testified? You know, unfortunately, it's going to take another 9-11 type attack before people understand that this, this needs to be fixed. I don't want to see that happen. I'd rather fix it now. Before okay. anything like that happens. On that happy note, let's uh, turn to questions over there. Start over there in the back. Thank you, Tom. Tom Warren, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Security Integration. Thank you for joining us today. Um, great discussion today, and great four days discussion about the policies, the issues facing us from a national, international, homeland security perspective. And I applaud the concept of an authorization bill for DHS. Great idea. But the reality is, when we all break from here and try to apply the issues, the policies that we've discussed, we have to go back and match capabilities to requirements, and we have to match strategies to program investments. And the reality is, as we've talked about several times today, and we've heard from our leadership, that we're faced with another round of sequestration in 2016. And this is all well and good, but as the businesses in the front row will tell you, if you don't make your balance sheet reflect what you want to do as a company, you know, this seminar, this forum is going to run out of sponsors in the future if they don't do that. And the reality is I'm asking what is Congress going to do to ensure that we make the appropriate and predictable investments anymore to address the types of things we've talked about this week, and quite honestly, for the last five years we've assembled in this room. Okay. Can I, well, let me, t let me just say one thing about the jurisdictional issue again. I hope all of you will go back and help me in my effort. Uh, with my leadership, I know the 9-11 victims' families, and I'll tell you why, not only from an oversight standpoint, why it's so important, but legislatively. My cyber bill got hung up for six months because another committee would not give up their jurisdictional hook over it. For no other reason, the policy was right, but for no other reason than jurisdiction. U.S. exit program, we talk about visa overstays and the hijackers, same thing. I have another committee, I don't want to name it out, but it's holding, it <laughs> it's, holding this bill up. Right. That's dangerous. To answer your question, I mean, 
I don't, you may not want to hear all this, but I think until we, and this gets into a broader issue, if we can't reform entitlement spending, we're never going to get there. These entitlement programs, two-thirds of the budget, without any reform, are going to completely take over the federal budget if we don't act now. And there are things we can do to, to correct that course that we're on. But it squeezes our national defense capabilities and our national security capabilities. I'll give you one example. Because we can't touch entitlement spending, and, and now we're, we are squeezing with the sequestration, the Navy has had to pull out of their interdiction efforts in South America. And now the Coast Guard under DHS is having to scale back. So it's really all these kids coming up when I met yeah. with the Southcom commander. I mean, what kind of a threat is that? Well, all the drugs, potential terrorists, Jayadif is down there in Miami, they can't, or Key West, they can't stop all this stuff. That's the cold hard reality of the budget process right now. And we have to, to not only balance the budget, to, to, we have to reform those entitlements to get, to well, get there, I think. Let me just add to that. Sequestration is the brain dead default position of yeah. Congress. And no one thought it would actually happen. Exactly. Uh, because everybody thought that some version of Simpson-Bowles, you probably all know what that is, bipartisan yeah. recommendations, which included uh, entitlement reform and tax reform and spending reform, uh, some version of that would be agreed to. Well, unfortunately, the toxic partisanship of Congress prevented that from happening. Right. And I'm a Democrat. I strongly favor entitlement reform as part of a broader package. I voted, I personally voted for welfare reform in the Clinton administration, which passed on a bipartisan basis. So this would, would should be achievable if there were more people like Mike in Congress in well, both thanks. parties. Well, and we were told that. Yeah, vote for this, but sequestration will never happen. It's too draconian, and it, and it happened. So yeah. um, why don't we come over here? Try to keep Ooh. it brief because we just have a few more minutes. Diana, tell them where you work. Diana Negroponte, and I'm a scholar at Jane Harmon's Institution, the Wilson International <laughs> Center for Scholars. A ringer. We have a ringer. But I have another identification, <laughs> Chairman McCall. I am the mother of five children adopted from Honduras, and my question is very short. Will you lead a congressional delegation this summer during this, this recess to visit Honduras and see on the ground the danger and fear that families are living because yeah. of the violence. Well, and we, and that's a great, you know, I've been down to the border multiple times. Our working group did lead a delegation to Guatemala and Honduras. <clears throat> and and she, you're correct, Honduras, arguably one of the most violent countries in the world now. The most, and, the highest and, murder rate. You know, probably they say more than Kabul. Yeah. So it's a conditions on the ground. Um, the presidents of those countries, when we met with them two days ago, kept stressing the, the economic conditions and, and the job opportunities. And I think that's something that we need to be looking at as well. They don't want to lose their children. They really don't. They, they want to keep them. But it's the smarter ones leaving. You know, and they, they don't have opportunities. And so they want us to work with them to create better opportunities. <clears throat> How do we do that? I think working with a lot of these NGOs and Catholic charities, we do have foreign aid, a lot of it's counter-narcotics. Foreign aid, as you know, is a very ugly word these days in the Congress. There have been some to say, well, just cut off all foreign aid to these Central American countries. I don't think that's really the correct answer either because it's, just, it's gonna get worse. And it's going to create worse conditions down there. And it's a combination of, of those conditions, a, a false notion that if they come into the United States, they can stay because of some of the messaging. Um, and it, it's that combination that we need to, to fix. Yeah. Chairman, can I ask you one thing if you happen to know? I saw a study, a Pew study came out in the last few days saying that something on the order of 90 to 95 percent of the children are girls. Do you? Do you know what the factors well, are? Is that related to the violence in Honduras? Or what, what, what would cause that to happen? I, I haven't seen that. I, I've seen 80% or 14 and older. Okay. Uh, well, but, you know, I, I, I saw these little girls. That, you know, it breaks your heart. 
I did mention earlier that uh, there is some conversation, I don't know whether Congress needs to approve it or would approve it, uh, about uh, it, a special effort being geared to Honduras, in Honduras, to decide whether some of these kids, I assume presumably mostly girls, are entitled to asylum in the U.S. under the 2008 law, uh, and then to safely transport them to the U.S. and not put them through all this agony and then the, the, the additional tragedy of going into the illegal yeah. diaspora here. And that's an important point. Even if we change the 2000, legally, you always have, you can always make a claim for political asylum, you know, based on a fear of persecution in your home country. So it, the, the change of the law would not change that. Um, so, but I, I agree, I, you know, it's not easy. And you know, we can't even balance our own budgets in the United States now. And, the American people are very angry. We can't take care of our own people. And so sometimes crises like this bring out the worst in the American people. Or the best. Or the best. And I think this is a test for this nation as to how are we going to deal with this. I personally think we have to deal with them. Having, having seen them, and they impact my state more than any, we have to deal with them in a humane, compassionate way. But I do think a message of deterrence that if you come, you, you can't stay, it needs to be done because they're just going to keep coming. Uh, and we have to work with the countries of origin on the root causes of, of the problems. Can, can we do a speed round on the question since we're coming down to our last few minutes and we'll take, let's try to take three and get some quick responses and then we may have to wrap up. I'll, how about um, Mike Levine back there in the corner and um, then we'll take a couple other ones. Hi, Chairman. Mike Levine with ABC News. Uh, you brought up the Al-Nusra AQAP link. Uh, some of that first intelligence came up in January, but the new directives for airports overseas didn't happen until last month. Do you know what changed between those months, and are you concerned at all about how long it took? Let's take a couple more, and then there's two gentlemen right here. Do you want to answer that? Okay. We'll do an answer. Oh, okay. 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 Representative <clears throat> Rossellimo, Center for Security and Social Progress. Yesterday, sitting next to me at the table here, a participant made a very insightful comment about the role of uh, so social, me so social media. Uh, I want to give credit to her. Um, social uh, media spread information, misinformation, disinformation at electronic speed. And this can have negative consequences when it comes to, for instance, the children's issue and national security in helping recruit uh, uh, terrorists, for instance. Do you see a negative side to social issues and um, what, if anything, should we do, do about it? Okay, and this gentleman right behind you. In the Thank you, Steve Shapiro, uh, running a BEND project on domestic intelligence reform. This is so inappropriate for a speed question, but I'll do my best. Uh, back to the uh, <laughs> oversight issue. I think that the, quickly the bigger issue isn't that Homeland Security, and I applaud you for bringing out an authorization bill, congratulations. The bigger issue is that the whole Homeland Security enterprise is not treated as one enterprise. Right. And so it's salamied up across the federal government and it's salamied up throughout the Congress, no surprise. Would you support the concepts of a national intelligence framework for domestic intelligence like there is for foreign, enabling then a holistic look at the issues, a holistic budget which can deliver, be delivered to a Congress to look at as a pie rather than as a salami, and then <coughs> have perhaps a domestic intelligence appropriations act and get all the committees who want to play in a big room and you can all package it together and look at it as one mm -hmm. instead of everybody looking at this little piece and this little piece and domestic security never being looked at as an entire national enterprise. Okay, three that's very a quick disparate question. Wow. questions. Let's <clears throat> all right, let's yeah. okay. start with So that, that real quick, uh, well, that's very, Complicated. I mean, the CIA does not have jurisdiction in the United States. Uh, DHS has an intelligence and analysis, you know, component, and that takes intelligence from CBP, from TSA, unique products within DHS to help and assist the FBI. And uh, Director Mueller's here, I think. Uh, yes. The FBI really is the the domestic counterterrorism intelligence, you know, force in the United States, and so. That's why I try to work, you know, reach out to the FBI, have them working with DHS to protect against threats to the homeland. Those budgets are looked at Oh, they are. Yeah. Uh, well, at one point they were talking about putting the FBI under DHS, and I know, I know the Bureau was we, not. We, we've seen this didn't movie. Didn't want to do that. It's we have very seen this tricky movie. to do this. Uh, many is. think uh, we were overambitious in forming the Homeland Department in the first place with right. the 22 agencies and departments. 
Uh, the decision was made by the hearty little bipartisan band in Congress that wanted a homeland function to go with that concept, which was developed by the Bush White House because we knew President Bush would support it. Probably overbroad, and yes, because of the jurisdictional issues and culture issues and everything else, it's been a, a hard slog to get it to work as one. It's really doing better. Jay Johnson, when he was here, said that he would certainly like a more joint command authority over the agencies that he supervises, because he said he's the only one all these border agencies report to. There's no second level of management over them. But on the intelligence side, we also saw that movie. In 2004, I was extremely involved. I was one of the so-called big four designing uh, the intelligence reform package that became law. It was very tricky. The Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, opposed it. The Vice President of the United States, uh, Dick Cheney, opposed it. The Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, a guy named Duncan Hunter, opposed it. But President Bush was for it. Pete Huckstra, who was then uh, my counterpart on the Intelligence Committee, was for it. And we had champions in the Senate, uh, in Susan Collins and Joe Lieberman, and we got it passed. It's not perfect, legislation is sausage, but we do have a joint command structure over our intelligence agencies, including those that do the domestic side of intelligence. And one of the things we did in that law was to form the National Counterintelligence right. Counterterrorism Counter 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 Center, NCTC, uh, yes. And uh, which has been a, an enormously uh, important uh, piece of this domestic intelligence structure. I think if you, do, if you think people were upset about the haystack that the federal government uh, assembled under this uh, Section 215, the notion of a, of a coherent and huge domestic intelligence capacity would have people running for the hills. So I don't think that can happen. I just wanted to make a comment on uh, a couple other things. Social media uh, is here to stay. We're not going to change that. Uh, it has driven bottom-up successful efforts to topple governments. Uh, but it also has driven and can drive the dissemination of a good narrative about what we stand for and, and, and why people should not go to the dark side and why they should join us. So the opportunities with social media are huge. And the goal is to make good social media trump bad social media. And finally, I don't know about uh, any delay in this uh, foreign side, maybe Mike does. Uh, John Pistol could probably answer that better, but I love John Pistol, so, yes, so I cannot imagine that he delayed anything. Well, well, Mike, can I'll I just follow? Because um, NCTC really is that entity that he's talking about, and they do a fantastic job. Social media, we saw what Inspire Magazine did with Tamaril and Cernayev. Uh, the, the internet activity, the radicalization over the internet's real. Even though I, or I would argue you got radicalized in Dagestan as well after the Russians warned us about that. Um, social media can be, can be a great tool for us, but a great enemy yeah. uh, as well. With respect to, all I can say is without getting into classified, uh, is that the threat became more credible and specific over time. The link, we saw that, but the threat became more specific and credible which I think John Pistol did exactly the right thing, uh, you know, protecting American lives, these, these you know, overseas inbound flights coming into the United States. That, that's what they want to do, is blow up an airplane flying into the United States. Right. All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap Can it up. Can I just yeah, give, sure. give my good friend here a shout out? I mean, she Absolutely. was a joy to work with in the Congress, and now the head of the Wilson Center, done a fantastic job, and I really look forward to being a real partner and ally with you. I appreciate what you do. You. So it's been a good discussion. Hopefully, you know, these panels are often spirited, but they're always cordial. And then maybe some of that, that atmosphere can be transplanted back to Washington, D.C., and uh, some of these problems can get addressed in a bipartisan way. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for coming out at 9 o'clock in the morning. More people here than I would have expected.